tell us, what's the meaning of the principles such as care for the community of life, such as Earth Charter 1, respect Earth and life and all its diversity, or Earth Charter Principle 2, care for the community of life with understanding, compassion, and love? What are the meanings of those for you? Well, I think care for the community of life is essential to what the Earth Charter is about, what many people around the world are trying to figure out as well. But the new thing here is the community of life. Because for the most part, we've had ethics for humans. We've had a sense of divine human relations. But we've left out of the equation human-earth relations, for the most part. And so this sense of respecting not just nature or the environment is out there, but as that which actually has given birth to life, human and natural. Um, so this sense of care for the community of life means the whole earth community, nature, humans, uh, and all living things. Okay, so that's the respect aspect of it. What about the care? Well, care takes so many new dimensions nowadays, too, as we move into uh, biodiversity loss and some of the environmental problems, climate change, and we begin to see the, uh, the, the challenges that await certain forms of biodiversity that aren't able to move. So care in the human context is situating the human in the community of life rather than apart from. There's so many questions about what's our relationship to this, uh, this new sense of challenge for biodiversity. But I think care has to be um, re-inhabited. It's why this question is so important. Um, care can sometimes have a slightly condescending view, you know, care as aid to the developing world, um, or care <clears throat> as aid to the less fortunate, something like that. But this, this is more reciprocity. This is a feeling of resonance. This is a feeling we are cared for by this dynamic, flowing natural world. And so it calls forth care and compassion from us. But we have to inhabit that in new and fresh ways, redefine it, find the words for it. Um, and that is, that's a big challenge. I think that care also had some sort of strong ethical foundations in our earlier thinking about it. But now this care reaches into the science, social science dimensions, we begin to understand care as a, a deep understanding, akin perhaps to what indigenous people, it's what's described as their traditional environmental knowledge, real empirical knowledge, and yet the base of it, what its motivation, has a different uh, ethical perspective uh, than simply separating out. Yeah, and to pick up on that, you know, that indigenous peoples would have a sense of kin, deep kinship with all living forms, that they speak to them, they are life uh, forms. So that the sense of kinship then is expanding out from, from the human. Mm. But um, kinship, um, I think, will instruct us on what this actually means. We think we can manage ecosystems, we think we can manage a forest or a fishery and so on. Um, there's some deeper knowledge embedded in the world itself that if we bring that forward, again, care will come flowing forth in a whole new way. So our science has to be embedded, really, in an ethic of reverence for life, which is also a new shift. So it's not just humans going forth and caring. Our sciences, our policy, and so on, we, we just talked to a professor at the law school at, at Yale, and he came over and said, I want to work with you all because you do this religion and ecology. And I, he said, I do environmental law out of a sense of reverence for life. Now, Schweitzer, of course, had this very deeply, but that is a new dimension for law to talk about protecting ecosystems because of reverence for life. So this sort of leads into the next, uh, the next bit, which is more about interdependence. Interdependence is a theme in the Earth Charter, which uh, is stressed in, in, in a couple of different ways. Uh, the interdependence of all the principles on each other, but also the interdependence of all life on, on each other, or on other, all in, the interdependence of all life on itself. Or, um, could you talk a little bit about that? Well, I think 
<clears throat> interdependence is a key word for the Earth Charter, for ecology, for human society, and for our critical moment. <clears throat> Again, I would suggest that we have to expand this and inhabit the sense that interdependence comes out of the universe itself. And that's why this sense of a 14 billion year old journey is the gift of interdependence. It didn't just come out of ecosystems. It came out of the emergence of stars and galaxies and planetary systems and solar systems. This is way beyond what we usually think of when we create documents like the Earth Charter. But why I love the preamble of the Earth Charter so much is that we consciously set this notion of interdependence is we are part of a vast evolving universe. Earth, our home, is alive with a myriad community of life. So universe and Earth are put together for the first time in an international document. It changes our perspective forever. And indigenous peoples in the Rio Plus Five conference in 1997 were overjoyed that their worldview of deep interdependence was in this document, too. Uh, interdependence strikes me as a term also that can become facile. It can, uh, uh, for, uh, for example, uh, drawing on the Buddhist usage of the term, it's, uh, it's ancient in their tradition, and so the sense of interdependence can be found in texts such as the Lotus Sutra, or in particular schools where they lift up the image of the jewel net of Indra, and uh, present it as if embedded within the, their tradition they have an answer to all of the questions. But what's striking about that is to see these terms beginning to take on if we pursue them critically and with a new understanding of what this relationship is. They begin to call us towards new understandings of these interrelatedness or what the dependence means uh, and, and in that sense I'm again underscoring the relationship between what we call disciplines or the role of the humanities in relationship to science and I think that's part of what the Earth Charter is trying to explore too, this juncture of ways of knowing, opening up ways of knowing in ways that are radically new. Um, that's I like that. I like that statement a lot. That was well put. Thank you. Um, so a lot of I know a lot of your work <clears throat> has been to explore um, religions and religious traditions and faith traditions and and how this um, sort of these concepts of a sustainability ethic or of interdependence um, how those can be explored through religious traditions. Um, would you talk a little bit about how some of what you just spoke about um, specifically relates to some specific religions? Um, I know that you just started to mention some, some, uh, some, something about Buddhism, and I'm not very versed in Buddhism, <clears throat> but I would be interested to hear about uh, some, of, some of those thoughts in relationship to Buddhism or Hinduism or Shintoism or Judaism or Christianity or Islam. Um, could you uh, just sort of explore some of those a little bit? Yes, the, the traditions that come to my mind are some of the traditions that we've uh, explored in this project on religion and ecology, on, on, in the form on religion and ecology. Yeah, for example, the, uh, in Hinduism, which is of course a colonial term for such a diverse range of traditions in South Asia and then now planetary because there are not only ethnic South Asian communities around the world, but um, practitioners who enter into this. And so one dynamic in, uh, in that tradition is a love relationship, a devotional relationship. And interestingly enough, that love or bhakti devotional relationship extends to rivers. And so the Yamuna, but especially the Ganga, the Ganges River, these are, to use the term goddesses, or, uh, these are these are focuses of worship in these traditions, or of reverence, of deep reverence. And the reverence is reciprocal. Uh, these waters, the jaw, literally can heal or give. So what happens when the rivers are polluted, totally polluted, eutrophic, they don't support life? You find in these traditions very interesting reflections on the issue, namely 
the pollution is one thing, the water is another, the, the Yamuna or the Ganga maintain their purity no matter what the pollution is. And some say, no, the river's in trouble, we have to assist her. And some say, she's dying, she's dead. And so this range of reflections that's totally new in the tradition in ways. I mean, there have been older issues with regard to the rivers and blocking the flow in the colonial period. But in every tradition you find this retrieval of very old values, religious values, being brought to new problems. Yeah, and I think what we tried to do in the Harvard Conference series from 95 to 98, when we brought together scholars and practitioners of the world's religions and then did 10 volumes of edited works reflecting on how do we retrieve these attitudes towards nature, these environmental ethics, and reevaluate them in light of present circumstances and then reconstruct because that's what the traditions have done over time. That's what theologians do for the Christian traditions. That's what rabbis do for Judaism, imams for Islam. So if we come back to the traditions of Asia, which is what I study most, uh, and what actually got us most, or I should say it got me most concerned about this as Asia modernized, as China and India with a billion people each um, moved into the industrial era, what would this mean for the planet, much less for their own ecosystems, which are being devastated by rapid and relentless modernization without limit? Uh, without a sense of limits. So, for example, in, in East Asia, in China, the traditions of Confucianism and Taoism and Buddhism have very rich, as we know, uh, sensibilities about human-earth relations. And this notion that we're embedded in these concentric circles of, of human life, but also of nature and of the cosmos itself. So the, the basic cosmology is in both Taoism and Confucianism, is heaven, earth, and human are one flow. There's not a radical transcendence to another world, but heaven and earth being the universe and earth systems as that which uh, holds and bodies um, the human. And the notion is that cultivation then, or spiritual discipline, means one cultivates oneself in relation to the seasonal cycles, to the changes of nature, to the dynamic and transforming powers of the natural world. Those are actual terms from the tradition. And that cultivation means there's a profound sense that we are affected by these cycles, these seasons, these changes, but we also affect them. And that's what we have to retrieve for certainly Chinese culture is doing that at the moment, but we as a planetary community can retrieve these traditions in modernity to affirm a multicultural, multi-religious, but planetary civilization. And the Chinese are very much re-invoking re this notion of what is Confucianism in the modern world? What is Buddhism and Taoism? And there's a revival of these traditions and in fact, the government is also pointing towards what they're saying is a counterpoint to the destruction of the environment, social problems, 66,000 protests a year in China around the environment. They're saying we must create ecological culture, drawing on our own traditions. So the government is doing this, academic departments of philosophy are trying to draw these traditions forward. Um, on a popular level, a woman named Yu Don wrote a book on Confucius. It sold 10 million copies. There's this, this sense that materialism on this scale, with a spiritual vacuum, such as happened under Mao, needs to be uh, recalibrated, rethought, and that the spiritual traditions of their own um, historic past uh, need to be put back into place for not just sustainability, but I like to think of the flourishing of the earth community. We like to say our relationships, not just sustainable, but flourishing. Mm -hmm. And that um, gives us, I think, a new zest about what we're doing. I think one uh, dynamic that I find important for the Earth Charter is that the Earth Charter is a document that provides a, a, a discourse or a meditational setting or a discussion setting in which religions consider, say for example Christianity, that uh, the relationship between social justice 
and in eco-justice, environmental justice, which is now you find these discussions emerging in, in the Christian traditions, uh, Greek Orthodox, Roman Catholic, the pr pr Protestant denominations, evangelical Christianity, so that social justice is very old in all of them in terms of, of a concern. But now we find, say, even in evangelical Christianity, an awareness that climate change will affect the most poor. So although evangelical Christians are very hesitant to talk about environmental issues, suddenly the social justice issue and climate change affecting the poor, that environmental justice comes together. And Earth Charter provides a way to frame those meditations, if I can use that term, rather than just discussions, they become meditations on this new turn. So it's very interesting. I'm, my my brain is I'm sure is <laughs> flowing very rapidly with <clears throat> with thoughts and implementing it. You're probably thinking. Well, um, I mean, the I'd say the question that that came up or that's been coming up to me, and, and I hope you don't mind that I'm jumping around a little bit because I, I have to react to what I'm hearing. Um, Maybe, I mean, I can hear that both of you are, are quite hopeful, uh, but I would actually, I'd like to, to sort of take a little bit of a step back, and, and you mentioned that, uh, the, that the, the influence of Mao in China um, was re really separated people from these, these spiritual principles or, or their faith values, which um, had connected them previously more to... to um, the stewardship of the environment, <clears throat> and that was lost, or that was that was diminished in importance in the values of that society. Um, but of course, we don't see it, that that kind of diminishing of those values only in China. We see it everywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. And and maybe could you uh, both uh, talk a little bit about um, what you think the the root causes are of those values being lost, um, you know, across the world. Um, and, and, and how, how come those traditional faith values sort of lost out um, and, and, and weren't, um, weren't carried forth? One way I would uh, characterize this uh, diminishment, confusion, or obfuscation of the, the, the trajectory of care and compassion in religious traditions with regard to the natural world is uh, I would characterize it as technologies of care. That in the uh, early expression of these traditions, the dominant cosmology framed the context in which a technology of care might be undertaken. And these t technologies of care literally feeding groups or organizing ways in which food is distributed or a variety of techniques in which care and compassion are delivered to a community and to the community of life. As uh, we entered into the so-called secular period, because I, I'm not entirely sure I, I agree with the separation from the, the cosmological implied by that term, but nonetheless, technologies emerged as becoming an end in themselves. And the complexification of technology suddenly moves our technologies of care uh, uh, in a direction apart from the trajectory that they were oriented towards in these traditions and towards technologies as an end in themselves. So these are very critical questions, I think, in our time. How care and compassion are motivated and implemented. One example would be the parks and the movement of indigenous peoples out of parks in the name of saving biodiversity within the plant. That's a technology of care, it seems to me, but it's, it has problems. And well, I think you're asking a question, though, about secularization and religion in the modern period, which, of course, a lot of people have commented on and studied and, and so on. But a lot of people have made those comments out of the North American and European worldview which uh, in Europe in particular, there was, because of many of the religious wars, I think more of a keen interest in separating religion and state. And that has been very well established in, in North America and in Europe. But I think the efforts to do away with religion in the former Soviet Union and in China 
in the 20th century, while effective on certain levels, when religious freedom was reinstated in China in the, in the 80s and in, in this Russia, it came roaring back. And there's a huge um, revival of, of the Orthodox tradition in Russia and of Buddhism and Confucianism, as I've mentioned. Um, but one thing I want to also just make sure we all understand here is that the traditions that have views of nature that are compatible with an environmental ethic in the pre-modern period, it did not, didn't mean that they didn't destroy their environment as well. So ideas and praxis, you know, theories and uh, implementation, or the historical record, the environmental history, we still have to examine greatly. But what I would say is that um, the statistics show in our modern period, 85% of the world's people are religious practitioners of one sort or another, and incidentally, many of those would be syncretic, especially in Asia, that Buddhism and Confucianism and Shinto all mingle in, in Japan. Uh, you're buried as a Buddhist, but you, you're married as a Shinto or even a Christian, and your early rites are, are Shinto, and your ethics at home are very Confucian. So there's a fluidity about these traditions, which have endured in East Asia, for example, and in China, as Dewey Ming, the great uh, philosopher of, of Confucianism, would say, the DNA of East Asian society, culturally and socially, is Confucianism. Human relations, you see, are all um, pretty much from a template of deep understandings of the past, how you treat your family members, how you treat uh, those who are older, how you treat teachers, and, and so on. So those have endured, despite the cultural revolution in China, and I think it's, it's not to say that religion is an answer for this ethic of care or for environmental ethics, but it's one part of the solution that is indispensable for our understanding of science, policy, economics, education changing for sustainable development and so on. But the world's religions and ethics need to be part of this conversation, very much so. Okay, and how do you think the Earth Charter fits into that conversation? Well, I think the Earth Charter is an umbrella that includes all of these disciplines, for sure. Um, it begins with this large cosmology, that we're part of a vast evolving universe. Um, it begins with immense respect for indigenous traditions, and it, it, it's worked out in the principles um, as well. Um, so it's a document that has a voice that can speak to many people. It has a, a, a political attunement to democracy and nonviolence. It has a, a deep sense of justice for the social and economic conditions under which we labor and the inequities of our world. But it, it bases its, um, its hopes on ecological integrity, which, again, our sciences and our, our environmental studies are, are pointing us towards ways of resilience of ecosystems, of restoration, which we need. So that integrated conversation of ecology, justice, and peace is, is crucial. But throughout it is a language of spiritual um, promise and hope. And that, I think, distinguishes it from many international documents. I wanted to add also the sense that Religious traditions are often identified as wisdom voices, and I'm echoing here Thomas Berry and his work, say, Dream of the Earth, or the great work, two of his works, that, that attempt to articulate what he means by that kind of uh, characterization of wisdom voices in the human family. And so he, he saw the Earth Charter as... Um, Making as providing a challenge also to these wisdom voices in the religious traditions, namely they had to move into human uh, earth uh, relations, and in that sense, I, I find myself thinking more about the phrase world religions. It used to be I would see the apostrophe as world's religions, and the the character of what was transmitted by that phrase was generally a a religion or a tradition that was meant for everybody. And those kind of universalizing agendas we now are, are, can be very, it can be deeply problematic if they aren't ca carried out in some critical agenda about what communities, what locations, what are we doing when carrying this message. 
So I find myself using the phrase world religions now, not simply to talk about traditions that are meant for everybody, but that these are traditions that are in the world. They come out of the world. And so Earth Charter is constantly reminding me of that new perspective that we're dealing with the human in this emergent process as having come out of. And that which has sustained that process will sustain us as we go forward in this effort. Nice. That's useful. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> let me see, let me go back to my questions here. Mm. Yeah, how about this question? So, um, well, some of the some of the things that you're talking about, especially in the in the film, uh, the journey of the universe, this and, and you talk about the cosmology and our sense of where, you know where we belong in, in the universe. Um, <clears throat> and I wrote this question because this is something that that I sometimes feel. Um, that sometimes um, I feel quite small, and um, it, it this sort of thinking about my place as an individual uh, in 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 when thinking especially about things on a very large scale makes me feel quite small and unimportant, and and I think that I'm not alone in that, and I think also it makes people feel why should I care, and and how do you address how would you address somebody who, who said, you know, this is, how, this is how it makes me feel, why should I care? Well, I think it's a wonderful question, why should I care, and I am just a small part of a huge universe, of which we're only getting glimpses of what is this deep time, this vast unfolding journey of the universe. And I think it's... It's appropriate that we say we feel small. It's, it is the case in relation to this great uh, dynamic process. It's, it's something like when we go out to the night sky here in Costa Rica or wherever on this planet that we can see the stars and the galaxies sometimes in the distance and the constellations, that we feel our smallness. But I think it also evokes in us, doesn't it? Especially if we lie down in the grass or the, wherever we might be and allow that feeling of the light coming to us over time and what it took to create those stars and what a supernova is even that gives us the gift of life from it, the elements that come out of a supernova. So if we, if we I think, allow this sense of the universe coming into us, we can, um, we can get this feeling we actually belong here. And that's what Journey of the Universe ends with this sense, these words, we belong here. We've always belonged here. And if we can somehow evoke in ourselves, and I, I mean that for every individual, you know, this isn't just an instant, aha, it's, it's the evocation in our heart, in our mind, in our body, that we have come from these processes and somehow we belong here. And even though we might feel a small part of it, I think what the religions have, have helped humans to do, because I think all humans have felt this in the past too, you see, is that we are a microcosm, right? A small cosmic unity of a macrocosm. And all these traditions have played this dance, you see, to kind of invite us into the small self, which sometimes becomes an ego self, into the larger self, which is an eco self emerging, you know, and even a cosmic self. And that invitation, it's, it's a life journey to realize, but it's an exciting journey. And that each person does have their role, their part to play in this great transition that we're in. I think this is actually one of the central discourses of our time, the central concerns of our time, the recognition that, uh, say, in the postmodern understanding of power and our relationship to power and what does it matter, uh, someone as small as myself, I, 
I have no place in these power dynamics. And yet uh, postmodern deconstruction is an effort to bring our intellectual capacities to bear on this and to really subvert that power so that, not that I grab it then, but rather there's something shared out. Just by understanding it, it's shared out. The discourse is shared out. And I think postmodern has really made a, a, a significant contribution in that regard. And I find they are also now challenged by the, the, where they have placed us, where they have brought us, so that everything is subverted. You know, why should I care what, what, in, the, in, the, in the face of this? One uh, example I, I see in, say, restoration ecology, very uh, powerful uh, work by William Jordan called Sunflower Forest, in which he goes to the range of issues with regard to restoration. How does a person undertake this act? What do you restore to? What was it like before? Isn't everything human manipulation or the postmodern insight that this has all been manipulated before? We think that this is a wilderness. Human hand is, is in, embedded in this. So that he presents uh, the term shame as the appropriate attitude for a restoration ecologist to cultivate before they lay their hands on nature. And again, I, I might not find that adequate for my uh, particular uh, disposition, but I find a probing or searching there that corresponds to what, again, my teacher, our teacher Thomas Berry would talk about as intimacy and distance. That sense of uh, the intimacy of laying one's hand in the natural world or on social relations and all of the dynamics that are involved there, positive and negative, and then the distance that we can hear in the phrase, why should I care, or what is this to me? And distance gives us the capacity for some analytical space, but I think it also allows for the possibility of return to the intimacy. And so both are necessary. I think why should I care is very necessary, but the return is also necessary. This is, this is who I am. I think I would just like to add to that in the sense that I understand what Jordan is trying to do in this book, but I think we have a huge sense of shame and guilt, I think, in our societies, especially in the North. Um, maybe we need a little bit more of that mm. sensibility of what we've done to the planet, uh, as plundering of resources. Um, but I think we need, we need humility. I think that's what this term is trying to invite us into. A humility to say we are a small part of a very large part. But I think we also need reconciliation. And reconciliation means we're actually going to need rituals of reconciliation, of mourning, of, of the loss. We're in a sixth extinction period. Species are dying out. We're the cause of it. Scientists are even saying we're watching at the edge of extinction. This is, humans have never had to absorb that. So I think there's an immense sadness and disempowerment in, um, in people in various parts of the globe about what's happening. And again, as I say, the causal problems, especially between North and South, developed and developing, are, are very intense right now because of the in tremendous inequities that have been caused by colonialism and imperialism. But I think that perhaps the religious traditions can help with this healing of this, these rifts between humans and between humans and nature. And that's where humility and reconciliation will be crucial. So yeah, to follow, just to follow up on that, and that was, that was good. And, and, do, and how do you think the Earth Charter can help? Well, I think the Earth Charter is a document that calls us back to um, a new sensibility of human earth relations, cosmic earth relations, and so on. And it points the way forward by identifying what we need to do, what we need to work on. So p each person can pick up, Confucius used to say, I won't teach a person unless they'll pick up the corner of the cloth. And we have many corners of a huge cloth of work to be done. 
work for women and children, work in the business community, work with a new politics of biodemocracy, work in sustainable education for sustainable development. And the Earth Charter pulls all of these possibilities together and says, pick up part of the cloth, get your hands dirty, but also see it as part of what Thomas Berry would call a great work, a great work of transformation to create this multicultural, multi-religious, multi-ethnic, but planetary civilization. And if we can ignite, which the Earth Charter has ignited in people and institutions around the globe, a hope of actualizing, realizing our independence, I think we can light a fire that will not be extinguished, especially for the next generation. And that's the hope of the Earth Charter, for this intergenerational handshake. You can do it. We can make it through this great transition. Okay, great. I hope so too. Uh -huh. um, let's see, here's a question that I like. Um, what are some positive signs that religions are adopting this cosmological worldview that you speak of? Um, the interdependence perspective or sustainability ethic and the understanding that we have responsibilities to care for the Earth community. So some concrete examples that you can point to that, that are happening right now. It's possible to identify religious environmentalism on the ground, uh, a phrase that's used increasingly to refer to local communities who are engaged in, uh, in activities that uh, enhance this flourishing of the life community rather than simply going on with their traditional uh, practice as usual. Uh, energy audits in church are, are one small example, the sense of changing light bulbs and then suddenly uh, beginning to move beyond simply the limited act of changing light bulbs or doing energy audits and I think that's where the Earth Charter plays an incredibly important role to help uh, local congregations move beyond simply the practice of a limited environmental act into the from strat from tactic to strategy to principle, not when well, not leaving them behind, but realizing these practices bring them into deeper connections and deeper considerations. I, I f find it's a uh, it, they, I get the risk of being misunderstood. These are technologies of care that if we begin to understand where they are taking us. They put us on uh, a, a journey. It's, I would, uh, I'm obviously playing a journey of the universe here, but it's a sense again of understanding the technology and what sight it provides me. What, rather than simply the technology as an end in itself, but rather what it helps me to see, so that these technologies of care begin again to bring us into the larger community of life. That, the cell phone and citizen science, it seems to me, is one expression of that. And although I'm moving away from religious traditions, it's, again, I, I don't think of religion simply within the institutions anymore. Some people, people use spirituality to talk, talk about that distinction, but I think they reverberate back and forth. Well, I think if we take up this question of what are religious communities doing, we can see it also through the lens of what are some of the needs, like water, like forests, like climate change. And so the religious leader of the Orthodox tradition, Greek Orthodox, the ecumenical patriarch Bartholomew, has held uh, over 15 years eight conferences, symposium, uh, bringing together scientists, journalists, uh, EU ministers and people from religious communities to attend to bioregions, watersheds, uh, all across Europe and then in, and in the Arctic and in Amazon and the Mississippi. This is incredible work on water. If you take forests and trees, you can again look on every continent. I mean, Wangari Maathai was deeply influenced by her Christian and her African background to set up the Green Belt Movement and empower the planting of trees. In South Africa, an uh, amazing tree planting project in Zimbabwe, where they actually took the tree planting as a Eucharist. Um, Buddhist monks are doing tree plantings and protection of trees in, in the South Asian communities and so on. And climate change is one of the most robust areas where religious communities are 
um, acting for climate justice and doing mitigation in their own institutions. So we could talk yeah. a, about a lot of projects that are happening. On the website, the Forum on Religion and Ecology website, you can find statements from religious leaders. I think Mary Evelyn's also uh, indicating that religious environmentalism grassroots up as well as from the top down. So the ambiguity and uncertainties are obviously still confront us, but I think people are groping. People are trying to find some way without getting caught up in a univic answer that becomes a new oppressive, some new oppressive imperialism. We're, we're really guarding to, to keep, preserve local independence in this interrelationship also. And what John's saying, I think, is, is principles, strategies, and tactics are coming into a certain confluence. I mean, we're working on what are the principles for transformation through journey of the universe, through a cosmo vision, cosmological worldview, uh -huh. and the religious ecologies as we're talking about it. Um, but I think on, on almost every level, if we come back to just the elemental, you know, why is water so crucial in all these traditions? Why is it considered sacred? Why is air that we breathe so fundamental for many of the meditative traditions? Why does yoga practice actually help the human um, inhabit the world through the cosmological systems? So does Tai Chi. It's, it's cultivating the breath in the human, Qi Gong. And with these different forms that are forms of insects and birds and so on. So we understand our body, mind, system, and, and breath. And food and earth itself, you know, all of these elements, food is coming back into human consciousness, awareness, and concern in a very powerful way. And I think all the traditions, of course, have rituals of planting and harvesting and thanksgiving for food and prayers for a daily meal. So this, this will be one of the great moments of transformation as the religious communities bring forward some of these rituals in new forms, but thanksgiving, and the next generation is so into you know, food, food safety, food growing. We just had a conference at Yale, 250 people. Um, it's one of those great nodes, food, health, and children, next generation which I think we can draw forward energy. You know, it's interesting to think, well, or to make the statement, well, religions are so retarded with regard to <laughs> genetically modified food. Why don't they say anything? But if I think of it for a moment, my local community or state, nation state, or even local province or state, why aren't they speaking about at least some discourse or having some discussion about labeling, should we or should we not? So I think this is incredible ambiguity and the fact that the religions are tentatively trying to find their way, just as other organizations and communities are also. It's uh, it, it, it's a uh, up for grabs, or it's the discussion is still out. But it's an exciting time to see these religions tentatively enter into these discussions. Yeah, and again, I think we can return to the sense that um, science, law, economics, policy, and education are absolutely essential to this transformation to ecological cultures. Um, but we would say they're necessary but not sufficient, mm -hmm. just as religions are necessary but not sufficient, because they need to be in conversation. So from the beginning of our work at Harvard, we always had scientists and economists and policy people there to make this dialogue juicy and diverse. And what the religious communities can bring, hopefully with humility, without rhetoric, without over-moralizing, but with this sense of our common spiritual yearnings, our, our common deep night, late night belongings, to belong, to be part of something deep and profound and enduring, and we don't even have words for what that is. And that these traditions, even as we go back to what their texts say and their traditions may do and their ritual practices, but we're looking now, I think, all of us humans, inside religions or outside religions, for this response to a call from the natural world, from these living, dynamic, organic systems that's beyond even naming, but it's so palpable. It makes our skin stand up when we see a magnificent sunset or sunrise. Or, or, or the clear cut. 
That's true, too. But we're in the presence of mystery, is what I'm trying to say. We're dwelling in mystery. And when we see its devastation, that new dance that we have to do between hope and urgency um, is, is the call. And we really want to say this can be done with religious traditions beyond religious traditions. Many people say, I'm spiritual, not religious, and so on. Fine. All hands on deck. We need the arts, we need music, we need literature mm. uh, to this change to, to come to the table. Well, it's very, I mean, it's very exciting when, to think about it because I, I mean, definitely within my lifetime, the, you know, the environmental movement has grown up um, and it's something that I've grown up with in, in, in the course of my life and really seen it and I've been quite interested in, in the in social movements towards environmental conservation since I was quite young. And I, I find that, and, and, and you know, I, I dedicated, decided to dedicate my life to, to this work as well. Um, and, and I have such an, such an issue sometimes dealing with, especially I think in, you know, because you're, you live in the United States and you're subject to to dealing with uh, you know the United States policy on uh, on a lot of these issues mm -hmm. and how slow and backwards it is in a lot of ways. Um, w what do you think uh, about this transition that we're going through and this awakening that we're that we're slowly experiencing um, as a species? Um, is it happening fast enough? Uh, I'm intrigued that some of the old-time environmentalists, just to draw a few names out of that, uh, James Gustav Speth, or Gus Speth, former head of UNDP, and um, uh, Johanna Macy, or people who've been around, John Seed, people who've been around for a long time in the so-called environmental movement. And the clear understanding that they have that the litigious, policy-oriented, moralistic approach has uh, let us down and that they, we made serious mistakes in not bringing the larger public into an understanding of the foundational issues. And I think that's part of, again, the Earth Charter, to me, is, is an attempt to return and revisit foundational issues. I think this whole question of urgency and time, do we have enough time, and we've been hearing it for 30 and more years. Uh, and it's a very legitimate question. We hear it around the world, um, from the next generation and from those who've been involved for a long time, that we don't have enough time. And that's true. But what do we do? Mm -hmm. You know, people like Wangari Mathai would say, we plant a tree. We'll never see it grow. And that spirit will never see the fruits of our action. Of course, it comes out of the Bhagavad Gita, it comes out of the Tao Te Ching, of Taoism, the, the Wu Wei. We'll never see the fruits Islamic, of our Islamic uh, stories of Bohemian. But I think this tremendous sense of awakening, as you've put it, um, and the great transition, as it's called by many people, uh, is this is a unique moment in human history. 150,000 years of being Homo sapiens sapiens. This is the moment that maybe we can earn our full name of being wisdom keepers, being um, caregivers, uh, being compassionate lovers for the earth. But I think it's going to take um, a sense of this full-bodied understanding that this is a living universe. This is a sacred universe. And we need to have language that... Um, brings that forward powerfully and without even defensiveness. Um, because when we lived through the civil rights movement, and we had an apartheid society in the U.S., and I was deeply engaged in that, went to college in Washington, D.C. to be involved in it. But when Martin Luther King and others from the religious community spoke truth to power, to say this is morally unacceptable. When the Quakers, who started abolition in, in the UK, said this is morally unacceptable. And people said, oh, we, we, our whole yeah. empire depends on it. We're at the same moment. Our empire depends on destruction. And that is morally unacceptable. 
And so when we get a language that's going to have traction for people coming together on this issue, um, especially for our global future, especially for these inequities and um, a deeper north-south um, understanding and dialogue, because that rift is so large and it's a source of deep sadness for me. But that, that communal voice, and I think it's deeply present here in Latin America, why is this a spiritual issue? Why is it an ethical issue? Our environmental, ecological, social, uh, democratic transformation. That will be a huge, um, a huge gift for this trans transforming moment. Great. Well, I've been signaled that we yeah. are out of time. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I would love to sit here and talk to you guys for <laughs> ages and mm -hmm. get to half of the questions. And Well, they're good questions. So, I know, they're, they're, they're a lot of fun. Good. And I, I really enjoy listening to you and talking with you. And I'd love to have the opportunity to... Uh,